by means of low piles in front and traverses on the flank, were erected in fine, perfect preparation. It was thought made to receive the attack just, just at daylight, however, on the 12th, Grant's masked line flung themselves against that point, swept over the encounter of the captured about 20 pieces of field artillery, and near 2,000 prisoners, General Johnston among them, and broke the very keystone of our art. An effort was made as speedily as possible to recapture the work. The enemy pressed on to the inner line. What troops were sent against them, I do not know, except those among them were some of Anderson's old division. Hmm. General Abner Perrin charged brilliantly with his brigade, beat away the enemy from the interior line, jumped his horse over the work, and was leading the final charge up the exterior line when he was shot through and killed. Here the Confederate movement stopped short. Our brigade was sent to General Ewell to carry it through. So they came in after the initial attack group. When they arrived at the interior lines, it was the counterattack. Counterattacks. The demoralization of the troops that had been about this point was deplorable. They seemed to feel that Grant had all the hosts of hell in assault upon us. <laughs> to resume, the brigade advanced upon the work. About the time we reached the inner line, General McGowan was wounded by a miniball hmm. in the right arm and forced to quit the field. Colonel Brockman, senior colonel present, was also wounded. And Colonel J.N. Brown of the 4th Regiment assumed command. Then, or a little later, the 4 Regiment, 1st, 13th, 14th, and Rifles, the 12th had passed out to the outer lines, closed up and arranged their lines. Soon the order was given to advance to the outer lines. We did so, with a cheer and at the double quick, plunging through mud knee mud knee deep and getting in most heavily. They entered the point of greatest danger just at the break and received a concentrated fire of artillery that crashed through the works. And the fusillade of infantry from the front and across the traverses on the right flank. Men just across the works would in places thrust over their pieces and discharge them in their faces. They lost fearfully, but they fought nobly. Sometimes they would have to give way to the left, but they always rallied and fought at the nearest footing, so they gave to the left. The firing was astonishingly, astonishingly accurate all along the line. No man could raise his shoulders above the works without danger of immediate death. Some of the enemy lay against our works in front. Hmm. I saw several of them jump over and surrender during relaxations and fire. An ensign of a federal regiment came right up to us during the peace negotiations <laughs> and demanded our surrender. <laughs> Lieutenant Carlisle of the 13th Regiment replied that we would not surrender. Then the ensign, then the ensign insisted that as he had come under false, in, under a false impression, he should be allowed to return to his command. Lieutenant Carlisle, pleased with his composure, consented. But as he went back, a man from another part of the line shot him through the face. Dang. And he came and jumped over to us. Hmm. This was the place to test the individual courage. Some ordinarily good soldiers did next to nothing. Some, or others excelled themselves. The question became pretty plainly, merely to run the chances of it. Two men particularly attracted my attention. 
I regret exceedingly that I have not been able to ascertain their names, for I am anxious that they should have what little fame may be derived from distinguished mention in these pages. The first of these belonged, I think, to the 14th regiment. He was a tall, well-formed man, apparently just arrived at maturity. He was a private. He would load his piece with the greatest care, rise to his full height, which exposed at least half of his person. 